Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, Professor, I hear you. Yes, good afternoon. Can you guys can see my screen, right? Yes. Yes, I can. Yes, yes. Uh, professor, excuse me, but uh, but could you uh, align the microphone because uh, the sound is a little bit weak. Uh, sorry. I don't even know where the microphone is. Uh, it, it's to your left, I suppose. Maybe. May oh, it's yeah. a bit. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, yes. sound better? Yes, it's a lot better. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so that was the point that uh, moving clocks go um, slower, more slowly than those at rest. Um, and then we started getting more into the formal, a bit more formal aspects of Lorentz transformations, and we're going to continue with that today. Um, so, the most general Lorentz transformation is just a linear transformation between the coordinates. Um, so, this is given by an invertible four by four matrix, and then Lorentz invariance means that the interval upstairs is the same in both frames. So if you just compute 
c squared t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared in the new frame you should get exactly the same answer so that's the definition of Lorentz transformations um, and then did we did we already start rotations yesterday? Yes, we do. Yes, we did. So, um, so anyway, let's pick up. How far did we get? Oh, we had this already, right? The, right. the convention and okay. So well, let's review that anyway. So, as we'll see today, so we're going to explore the sort of structure of Lorentz transformations. Um, and along the way, we'll have a kind of diversion into group theory, which is something that we'll be coming back to on and off uh, throughout certainly the first half of the course. So, as we'll see, Lorentz transformations consist of basically two types of transformation. One is rotations. Those are um, transformations which, for which the time coordinate does not change. So you're mixing just the space coordinates. And then, um, as we will see, these just correspond to literally rotating coordinates into each other by uh, you know, standard angles. These are just standard rotations in three-dimensional space. The other types of transformations are called boosts, and we will discuss those um, after we've discussed the rotations. So since we require invariance of, this, of the standard quadratic form, if the time coordinates are the same in both frames, then we get the condition that um, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is the same in both frames. And so we're interested, therefore, in the set of three dimensional or three by three matrices which preserve the standard, this standard quadratic form where the signs are just, just plus, plus, plus. So we introduced this um, uh, Einstein summation convention to denote this. So now we're thinking of x upper i as a row vector and x lower i as a column vector. And in the expression in the top right here, um, because we have one upper index and one lower index, this is we should we visualize that as taking the dot product of those two vectors, uh, which includes you know taking the summation. So whenever we see the uh, uh, a repeated label with one one of the labels upper and one of them lower, we sum over that label or index, which is the terminology we usually use for these labels. So then uh, similarly, the matrix R has indices I and J. And we write one upper and one lower because we think of a matrix as transforming a row vector, sorry, a column vector into another column vector if it's acting on the left. And so you see the expression here, the left-hand side is a column vector, and so is the right-hand side a column vector. And I explicitly wrote the one of the indices of R as being upper, and one of them as being lower, because I want to use the summation convention to describe matrix multiplication. Okay, so even though this looks straightforward, it's really, really important that you fully understand these expressions here and are you know 
if I were to give you just some random three by three matrix um, to understand in terms of its indices in this index structure, how to write down um, its transformation on some random vector. Okay, then similarly, the transpose of X lower I is X upper I. If you go from a um, column vector to a row vector, and then that vector, a row vector is naturally acted on by square matrices from the right hand side. And the natural candidate here is the transpose of R. So we're requiring that our expression is just the sum of the squares, but now we're thinking of it as the dot product between these two vectors um, is invariant under the transformation. So we compute its, its transformation once you make, um, once we act with R, it transforms into this quantity here. And that we can interpret as um, X row vector R transposed times R times the column vector. So um, in order for this quantity to equal the thing we started with, R transposed times R has to be the identity matrix. And such matrices which satisfy that condition are called orthogonal, because it's like an orthogonality condition of, of vectors. Was there a question or comment? No, okay. Just if you, you know, want to ask a question, just uh, go for it anytime. All right, so that means that the rotations in M are the set of orthogonal three by three matrices. And um, these also have the structure of what is called a group. And it's, this group is denoted as O3, O standing for orthogonal and three because it's acting on, it naturally acts on three dimensional vectors. Okay, so before we then get to, um, before we come back to the Lorentz group, um, we're going to do a sort of uh, lightning introduction and summary to various concepts in group theory, in um, uh, Lie groups in particular, Lie algebras and related things. Just kind of practical things that um, will stand you in good stead for many of the other courses. And some of this you'll also be covering in the quantum mechanics course with Narayan. Okay, so first of all, what is a group? Well, first of all, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a set, so a topological set. So it's just a collection of objects. So this could, these could be discrete points, like in a, you know, a discrete set, or it could be a, could be continuous, like a smooth space. And the set has to have a bunch of properties. There's four properties that have to be satisfied in order for a set to qualify as a group. First of all, there has to exist a multiplication rule. So I'm denoting that with this kind of uh, open dot just to be clear that we're using a, a rule. And the rule is such that if you take any two elements of your set, then the product of these two elements is also in the set. So this just means that the multiplication rule is a way of taking two elements of the, of the set and, and generating a third. It's just a rule. You can you know, well, I won't 
don't say any more about that. So it's just a rule for which assigns a, a pair of elements to a pair of elements, another element. Okay, there exists a unique identity element, and that one has the property that if you multiply it times a group element, or a group element multiplies it, then um, you get back the same element. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, transform you to somewhere else. So notice that the multiplication rule Um, does not tell you that this multiplication is abelian in general. <clears throat> but I mean, there can exist groups for which this is true, but this is just means in general. Okay. So most groups will not be abelian. Um, and then uh, there's the notion of inverse, and that means that for every element of the group, there's a unique element, which if you multiply it on the left or the right, it takes you to the identity element. Okay. And finally, group multiplication must be associative. And that just means if I take the product of G2 and G3, could be any two elements, and I multiply on the left with G1, I get the same result if I take the element G1 times G2, and take that element and multiply by G3. So group multiplication must be associative. And, you know, there do exist examples of spaces which satisfy you know, essentially all of these criteria, except, for example, associativity. And that would not be a group. Um, OK. Uh, and you'll see some examples in the exercises of that all designed to, uh, well, we'll come to those in a minute. But the first exercise um, that I'm going to set on this topic is to take the set of n by n matrices, you could consider real matrices or complex matrices. Um, in both cases, show that if you consider all of all such matrices which are invertible, then the set of matrices under, multi under matrix multiplication is a group. So you just have to check that all of these four axioms are satisfied. Um, now this is a this is a fact, um, and it, it's one that I want you to you know go through it. I don't want to demonstrate it here. I'd like you to go through it and demonstrate it. But it, it's it's a fact that we are going to use a lot. Um, there are some more exercises similar to this. So, and you know, if you don't un understand what I'm asking here, then please let me know and I'll try and clarify. Um, so the first one on this page is um, define a multiplication rule which makes the set of real numbers into a group. Okay, so try and, so in order to, to uh, define a group, first you start with some set, and then you just have to find a multiplication rule for which all of the axioms are true. Okay. So the first set we wanted to consider is the real numbers. The second one we want to consider are the complex numbers. Then uh, the third one would be to consider the set of non-zero real numbers. Yes, Miami. Did you want to ask something? Sorry. No, okay. Sorry, you were going like that, that's why. I don't think that's why. Um, so C, if, if it wasn't clear, C is the set of non-zero real numbers. Um, D 
we want to consider um, complex, we want to consider eta, which is a complex number, which is a pure phase, which is just e to the two pi i divided by k in the exponent, where k is an arbitrary integer. It's important that it's an integer. And then you take eta and you multiply it by itself as many times as you like. So you take eta, eta squared, eta cubed, where here I'm multiplying as a complex number um, and show that this set under, under um, uh, you know, ordinary complex multiplication forms a group. So this group is actually pretty interesting uh, example in the theory of groups. All right. Now, we're going to go back now to rotations. Well, first of all, let me, let me pause there and ask, are there any questions about this group theory business? Like, are the axioms clear and the questions clear? Um, professor? Uh, for, the, for the first two questions, uh, we just need to uh, find the solution about the inverse property. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, because, because the normal multiplication uh, can't, uh, can't make the, the inverse property hold for uh, the real numbers or the complex numbers. That's right. So that's why ordinary multiplication is not the answer to that problem. So that's well noted. Any other um, questions? Okay. So we'll go back to our rotations. Now, we said that we're considering the set of three by three orthogonal matrices. Um, again, you can check that these form a group under matrix multiplication. And the exercise is more or less identical to the one I set about n by n matrices. Um, so now, since the, uh, we have this orthogonality condition here, that means that the determinant of any orthogonal matrix squared is equal to one because the determinant of the transpose is the same as the determinant of the matrix. Um, so let's, for simplicity, so then that means that uh, orthogonal matrices split into two separate disconnected sets, ones which have determinant minus one and ones which have determinant plus one. Okay. Um, and both sets are isomorphic, you know, except that you can just they just differ by the change of a sign of um, of one of the entries. Yeah. So uh, let's we normally um, will consider proper orthogonal transformations or um, what are called special orthogonal transformations. So we just fix the determinant to be one okay, for most most considerations. Um, the elements of O three that don't, I mean, so because of this determinant condition, any element of O3 can be written as a product of an element of SO3 times a diagonal matrix whose determinant um, is, my, uh, is you know, plus or minus one. So the, the minus one, sorry, yeah, the minus one entries, I mean, the minus one determinant matrices would be, for example, uh, an example would just be the diagonal matrix minus one plus one plus one. Okay. Um, and you see that that actually has the property that it reverses the orientation of space. So this would be like a parity. These type of transformations are called, uh, are like parity transformations. Another one would be to reverse the sign of the, all three coordinates of space. So the diagonal matrix, which is minus the identity. Um, so that 
that's a parity transformation. And so um, those discrete symmetries play an important role in um, field theory and uh, we'll come back to them at the end once we've understood the rest of the Lorentz uh, group. So for the moment, we're just sticking with proper Lorentz transformations and that means when we restrict to the rotations, we consider just the um, special orthogonal transformations. Okay. All right, so I'm leaving it as an exercise for you to uh, establish that this is a group. Um, and now we're going to delve into some of the uh, group and algebra theoretic aspects of, of this group. Okay. Now, um, the, so as we'll see, SO3 is a continuous group. It has you know, an infinite number of elements and they're all continuously connected to each other. And um, the groups, the continuous groups that arise in physics are um, usually of what, what are called Lie groups. And these have the property that they are in some sense generated by an algebra called the Lie algebra. And the rough idea is that the group is the exponential of the Lie algebra. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate this to you like in an elementary fashion for several of the groups that will be of interest uh, in this course and other courses. Okay. All right. So say we make a further restriction on our rotation matrices and we say let's just consider rotation matrices now that, that only interchange x and y so in other words x y x prime y prime and z prime are actually x prime y prime and z so z is left invariant that means the matrix will take this form where a b c and d are to be determined well, the condition, because the Z now drops out of the condition by our further simplification, we have to satisfy this equation here. Well, if you just do that, I mean, we'll do, we can do that explicitly in a few lines. So X transforms into AX plus BY. So we take the square of that. Similarly, this is how Y transforms. This is Y prime. And if you then just multiply all of this stuff out, then the coefficient of x squared is a squared plus c squared. The coefficient of y squared is b squared plus d squared. And the coefficient of x, y is twice a, b plus c, d. And so since we want this whole thing to equal x squared plus y squared, the x, y term drops out and the coefficients of the y squared and x squared terms have to be equal to one. Okay. Well, if a squared plus b squared is equal to one, this is the equation for a circle in the variables a and b. And so a and b must be either plus or minus cosine theta. Or sine, I mean, one of them has to be plus or minus cosine theta, the other one has to be plus or minus sine theta. Okay. So let's look at the solutions of this type. And um, you can show that this is the most general um, special orthogonal two by two matrix. Can always bring it into this form. So, um, and it had to be, it had to have determined, you know, the signs get fixed by the determinant being one. I didn't mention that because the determinant of the 
SO3 matrix is one. So that, that means that the determinant of this two by two block has to be one. If you remember the form here of the, that we're restricting to. And that fixes the overall signs and um, you know, up to a redefinition of theta, you have, uh, it takes this form. So all special orthogonal matrices in two dimensions take this form, which actually means that the space of, of uh, it means that this group SO2 is a circle as a space. It's labeled by points on the circle. So the set that you start with is a circle because theta goes from zero to two pi. Okay, and theta and two pi give you the same element, namely the identity matrix. If I put theta equal to two pi here, I get the identity matrix. So, um, That means that SO2 as a set is a circle. Um, anyway, that's just to show you that this is an example of a continuous uh, group. You can reach every element by tuning the parameters of the group or the coordinates on the group. All right. Now, what about this? What I wanted to show you is this exponential business here, that I'm going to show you that these matrices can, uh, in a very simple way, be thought of as the exponentials of some other matrices. So, what do I even mean by the exponential of a, a matrix? Um, you know, the exponential is just a function. Um, so, we what do I mean? Well, what I mean is just the Taylor series expansion. So by exponential of T, I'm imagining that T has a parameter which sort of uh, makes it small in some sense. And the leading term is the identity. And then the next term is just T. The third term is T squared over two, etc. So the right hand side is the formal Taylor series of the exponential function, but now I'm interpreting it as the sum of a matrix and its products with itself. So T squared means T times T. So you see that the right hand side is, you know, if T, if T was an N by N matrix, then the right hand side is an N by N matrix. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about that? So now we see, um, on this slide, we'll see something remarkable. So let's consider the Taylor series expansion of cosine and sine. Those are the entries in our rotation matrix. So there they are, as we've seen many, many times. So let's take our matrix and write it as, write its entries as a Taylor series. Now, um, if you think about it for a few minutes, you can convince yourself that actually this, the right hand side is the, the Taylor series of a two by two matrix. It's this two by two matrix here, it's the exponential of theta times zero, one, minus one, zero. You know, if I take the leading term, well, given my definition of the exponential, then that would be one, plus then the leading term would be the matrix. So that's zero theta minus theta zero. The second term would be theta squared over two. Well, in this case, the square of the constant matrix is minus the identity. So I just get theta squared over two times minus the identity. That gives me this term and this term here. And uh, 
then you can continue in this vein to get um, all of the other terms. Okay, so I. So I urge you to verify the next few terms. Just to convince yourself that this is in fact an identity. So what this means um, is that this innocent looking matrix, zero, one, minus one, zero, I just multiply it by a parameter theta and I can generate any rotation matrix from it. So we say that this, this matrix here generates uh, the special orthogonal group. So that's what I'm, I'm writing here. Now, the thing is that, okay, what am I going to next? Yeah, so here we just picked the Z direction to be invariant, but we could have picked the Y direction or the X direction and the computation would be the same. It's just that the, where the entries of the matrix would be in different positions. So in our three by three matrix, um, so X, now I'm gonna think of this as being in a three by three matrix, what we get is this rotation. So um, that just means you extend by zero the rest of the matrix that you started, that we started with. So you can check again that this equality on the first line is true. Um, and then similarly, we can consider rotations um, about Y, and that gives us oops, these matrices here, and they're generated by what I'm calling T2, because T2 fixes X2 or Y. Similarly, the three by three matrix above, I'm calling it T3, because it fixes Z or X3, And finally, we have T1 in the bottom that um, generates rotations that fix X1. Okay. Now it turns out that this is all you need to generate any element of SO3. So you'll just start with one of these matrices, of some angle theta, so and multiply it by another one and another one. So in other words, uh, SO3 is a three-dimensional group. And in fact, you can check that by if you if you actually take these conditions for a three by three matrix. Three by three matrix has nine parameters, nine entries. Now, if you impose these conditions, you can see that these are actually six conditions on the nine parameters, which means you'll be left with three parameters. So. So, um, so that means that these, uh, these, these constant matrices, you know, these constant matrices, which are in this slide, T1, T2, T3, um, generate rotations in three dimensions. I mean, special orthogonal rotations in three dimensions. Okay, so next we're going to see that there's an algebra structure 
on this set of matrices on the T's. Um, and, that, and that structure is what's called the Lie algebra of SO3. But we'll take um, a 10 minute break first, okay? So we'll come back on my clock here. It says we're at uh, four, four zero minutes past the hour, or four one actually. But let's come back at five zero. Is that is that a yeah? I, I think that's a good enough break. So we'll see how as time evolves. If we need to have longer breaks, short breaks, or take the breaks at different times, what we do.
Nice. Get back to it. Okay, so we've seen that um, the rotations in three dimensions, and it's also true in any number of dimensions, um, are generated by these constant matrices. Notice that these constant matrices are anti-symmetric matrices. And in fact, um, the set T1, T2, and T3, um, if I take an arbitrary linear combination of them, theta i, T i, you can write any anti-symmetric three by three matrix that way. So the set of matrices is actually the set of anti-symmetric matrices. <coughs> and, um, so we use the words to say the words that um, the T's generate SO3. And now what we're going to see is that there's an algebra associated to the T's. That they are in fact elements of a particular algebra, which is called the Lie algebra of SO3. So what do I mean by an algebra? Similar to um, the definition of a group, an algebra is not just any, you don't start with any set, but you start with a vector space. So the T's, because there's three of them, you can think of them, you can think of the label, the index on TI as a, a label in a three dimensional space. And that's the vector space. And you have to give a, a composition rule again. And uh, in the case of this particular algebra, and for all uh, Lie algebras, that composition rule will be the commutator, if you're thinking of the elements as matrices. The composition rule is um, the matrix commutator. So let's compute the commutator of, say, T1 and T2. So if I multiply T1 and T2, if I've done it correctly, then we get this matrix in the top right. If I reverse the order, then I get, so T2 times T1 is this matrix here. And if I take their difference, I get the commutator and we find that the commutator of T1 and T2 is actually another of our matrices, which is T3. So um, I encourage you to you know, check this carefully. So, uh, so T1 and T2 gives T3, T1 and T3 gives minus T2, and T2 with T3 gives T1, okay? And this is the, so this is all of the non-zero commutators. Obviously, if I take T1 with itself, I get zero. But these are the, all of the non-zero commutators, and this is, this defines the algebra structure. Now, we can write this in a more compact form using our indices. And we write that the commutator of Ti with Tj is epsilon ijk Tk. So epsilon ijk is the totally anti-symmetric uh, tensor is a totally anti-symmetric tensor with the property that epsilon one, two, upper three is equal to one. 
And if I, for example, exchange one and two, I get a minus sign. Um, and so if I exchange any pair of neighboring indices, I get a minus sign. And all of the other elements are zero. So in other words, if any two indices are the same, so for example, epsilon one, one, two, that would be zero. <clears throat> and uh, that gives the definition, a definition, of the Lie algebra of SO3, which sometimes I will write as L of SO3, meaning Lie algebra of SO3. And um, remember, we were actually, so now I'm going back to the um, Lorentz group. And um, we were thinking of the three by three rotations as part of the Lorentz group. So if I now, and, and when we also know that the Lorentz transformations that we're interested in are generated by are given by four by four matrices. And the Lorentz group as well is a Lie algebra, uh, sorry, is a Lie group. So it's also generated by um, the Lie algebra of the Lorentz group. And uh, if I extend the T's to a four by four matrix by just adding zeros, then we get these T hat I's, which are given by these four by four matrices here. Okay, so those are our rotations. Now, what about more general elements? Any other element that's not of this form, but is a Lorentz transformation, um, will in fact mix the space and time coordinates because T is not gonna be equal to T prime anymore. So let's again simplify the problem and we'll just look at um, transformations for which Y goes to Y and Z goes to Z, but T and X change. So those would be given by these kinds of uh, four by four matrices. We have a non-trivial two by two block in the upper left. You have the identity matrix in the bottom right, and then you have zeros everywhere else. So now our condition of Lorentz invariance reduces to the condition at the bottom. And like we did with um, SO2, we can find the most general solution of this um, quadratic equation. So this I'm gonna give as another exercise. And the exercise is to simply prove that the two by two matrix we'll say has got entries A, B, C, D, is given um, by a matrix which looks similar to the cosine and sine rota of the rotation matrix, but now instead of cosines and sines, we get hyperbolic cosines and hyperbolic sines. And instead of the angle theta, we've got some parameter psi. So prove that the most general form um, is the one given here. That's the exercise. Um, so you'll either get the matrix, you'll either get this matrix or the one below it, but these are the same matrix um, up to a, a redefinition of psi. So the, the one at the bottom is psi. If I, if, I, if I take the one at the bottom and I change psi to minus psi, I get the one at the top. In fact, these two matrices are inverses of each other. <clears throat> okay, 
So the thing about, so even though this looks similar, there's a key feature which is different um, because cosine and sine take values between minus one and plus one, whereas the hyperbolic, uh, their hyperbolic cousins can take arbitrarily large values. Okay, so in the end, we ended up with this transformation property. So this is what the most general Lorentz transformation in two dimensions, so x and t, looks like. So this shows that the two frames are moving now relative to one another, but we want to give a better interpretation of what this psi actually is. So let's, let's go to the k prime frame and look at how the origin of that frame is moving, okay? So in other words, we set x prime equal to zero. If x prime is equal to zero, I can use the second equation here. And that tells me that x times the hyperbolic cosine is equal to c times t times the hyperbolic sine. Or equivalently, x divided by ct is the hyperbolic tangent. Well, x divided by ct is just the velocity, is the relative velocity in units of c. So this implies, and I want you to also check this, that the hyperbolic sine is given by v over c divided by the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. And the hyperbolic cosine is given by one divided by the same square root. So that means that x prime has this form. So you see that you get this, it's a linear transformation, just you know, by definition, because it's linear in t and x, but you get this function of the velocity appearing. And uh, similarly, you know, one can work out a similar formula for t prime, or c t prime. Okay, so now let's consider um, if T1 and T2 are the times of two events in K, what happens in K prime if they happen at the same point in space in K prime? So, that means we get two sets of transformations. We have to transform T1 and we transform T2. But X, um, X gets transformed to the same, I mean, the, the X prime is the same in the um, K prime coordinates because we're assuming that the two events take place at the same point in space. So if you just take those two formulae, take the difference, divide by C, you get uh, this result here, which is exactly our moving clocks go slower result from before. So that's, uh, I mean, that had to be the case, but it's, it's nice to verify it in terms of this matrix formulation. So there's a similar thing um, 
that happens to lengths in relativistic systems. So um, it's a, you know, another straightforward computation given the formulae that we wrote down. So we want to consider a rod of length x2 minus x1, which is aligned along the x direction and is at rest in the k frame. And then we want to compute its length in k prime. So since we're computing the length of the thing in k prime, um, the uh, t that will be done at one given time in k prime. So that means t two prime and t one prime are e are both equal to each other. And let's say they're equal to t prime. So we look at the formulas for x one and x two in terms of x1 prime and x2 prime, again, you just subtract, then the, the term which is proportional to vt prime vanishes when you take the difference. And we see that um, the, the boosted length is the original length times this Lorentz factor, the same factor, one minus t squared over c squared. Which means that moving objects are actually smaller than objects at rest. Um, and this is the phenomenon called Lorentz contraction. Um, it's discussed a bit more in Landau and Lipschitz. Um, all right, so, so now we've discussed rotations and we've discussed boosts. So these transformations that we're discussing here um, are called boosts because you take one direction, in this case we were taking the x direction and then we're boosting it by a certain amount, uh, which shifts the coordinate by uh, the velocity times the time, and then you and divide by the Lorentz factor. Um, now, so we just chose one direction for our boost, but of course we could have chosen any direction in in space, and we would have arrived at similar formulae. But again, with the entries of the matrices being in different positions. So it turns out that the boosts are all generate, I mean, you can generate all of the boosts by just picking the three, three coordinate directions, if you like, X, Y, and Z in which to boost them. So very similar to the discussion of the uh, rotations, we're now gonna look at the generators of boosts and then we will, uh, put that together with the uh, generators of the rotations and we will uh, work out the Lie algebra of the Lorentz group. Okay, so we'll do a similar computation. So in other words, we write the entries of the two by two block of relevance as um, Taylor series. So that's what we have on the right hand side. And then you can see that, and you can verify that that's actually the exponential of this matrix here, which is the parameter times zero minus one minus one zero. And obviously you'll get a similar form for whichever direction you pick X, Y, or Z to do your boosting. And what that means is that we have the following. So we'll call Psi X, Psi Y, Psi Z, or more 
in index notation psi sub i be boost parameters in the three directions so that the hyperbolic tangents of, of these three parameters are just the three different directions of velocity in units of C. And then, um, uh, the generators of the boosts are given by these simple looking matrices. So let's call these matrices uh, K1, K2, K3. And what we want to go on to study now is the Lie algebra structure of the boosts. So if I multiply, let's consider the commutator now of uh, K1 with K2. If I multiply K1 with K2, I get this matrix here. So I'll just go back to, so you can have a look at K1 and K2 and just verify by I that that's what we get. So you see the only non-zero entry is when I take the second row and I multiply it by, um, by K2 and I'll get a plus one somewhere. So that's the plus one there. That's the third entry in the second row. Similarly, if I multiply K2 by K1, I'll just get a single one. And the place that I get it is now, now not the second row, third entry, but it's actually third row, second entry. And because of the minus sign, that gives me this anti-symmetric matrix here. But you see that that fellow is exactly the generator of rotations in the one and two directions or around the, around the third axis. Which means that, you see, if you take the commutator of two boosts, you actually will get a rotation, what does that mean um, physically? Well, it means if I boost in the one direction and then I boost, do another boost in the two direction, and then I boost backwards in the um, two direction and I boost backwards in the one direction. Sorry, that's not, that's not true. No. I, I make a boost in the one direction followed by the two direction. Then I do the inverse boost in the one direction followed by the inverse boost in the two direction. I won't get back to where I started with, but I will end up getting close to it up to a rotation. And um, so that's the sort of geometric interpretation of um, what we're doing. So you won't quite undo the boosts that you perform, but you will get back to a rotation. You will do up to a rotation. Um, similarly, one can then, because now we're looking at, you see that the, we found that the commutator of two boosts is a rotation. So to fully understand the algebra, we need to look at the commutator of all of the boosts with the rotations as well. Okay, so, um, 
let's have a look at K1 with T3. So if I multiply K1, that's this matrix here with T3, I get a matrix with only one non-zero entry, which is the first row, third column is equal to minus one. If I then uh, do it in the opposite order and subtract, what I end up with turns out to be K2. So in other words, uh, if you combine boosts with rotations, you're going to get boosts back. And that makes physical sense um, because you can sort of think of that as a rotated boost. <clears throat> because you see T3 makes rotations in the one and two directions. So you can think of this as rotating a boost in the one direction into the two direction. Now, um, if you look at um, uh, the commutator of a boost and a rotation about the axis that you're boosting along, the result of that is zero because, uh, well, mathematically it's zero because, you know, if you look at K1, it's non-zero only in the upper left block, whereas T1 is non-zero only in the lower right block. So the matrices obviously commute with each other, but uh, physically, a boost is picking out a direction, but the rotations um, around that direction are orthogonal to it. So those processes commute. Um, so what this means is that These are always zero, so there's no sum here. So zero for all i. Okay, so that um, defines, so these computations of commutators. This defines the the algebra of the Lorentz group. So we had the rotations then we have these relations over here next, so next time we're going to write these in a um, a more compact form. So it's, it's these plus permutations. Of one and two and three. So that will give the three, that gives you these three relations here. And then we have that ki, sorry, just, just to be concrete, these are really key tilde's, the four by four matrices. 
but as an abstract algebra, it doesn't really matter. So this is equal to zero if r equals j and is equal to um, Better way of putting it would be well, yeah, I would have sorry, I'm gonna have to introduce some new notation tomorrow to write this in a more um, compact form. And but the, I mean really the compact form would be um, The way you compute it is by, well, no, actually, sorry, this is the compact form, sorry, sorry, my epsilon i is the, okay. Not equal to j. Okay, so, we've got this, We've now understood where are we at the beginning? A few um, we've now sort of understood a few things that the most general Lorentz transformation consists of rotations and boosts, and we've understood what rotations and boosts are. We've seen that rotations and boosts are generated by a Lie algebra, and we've computed the generators and commutation relations of that um, Lie algebra. Um, what we're going to do next um, is discuss what are called representations of this algebra. So um, at the moment, we're just thinking of these, the way we introduced the algebras was um, in terms of specific types of matrices, like orthogonal matrices, um, which leave certain quantities invariant. The algebra by itself, um, even though we can define it in terms of these matrices, one can think of a more abstract form of it. So as we will see, there are different sets of matrices of different dimensions which obey the same commutation relations. So for example, um, the the uh, SO3 Lie algebra, that one, even though we wrote down a representation of it, which is three by three, which are just given by these T's. One can find, for example, four by four matrices, which satisfy it, or five by five matrices, which satisfy it, or even two by two matrices, which satisfy it. But for any integer N, there's a representation. And similarly, um, for the full Lorentz uh, algebra and Lorentz group, um, there are representations of different dimensions. Um, so let me write a couple of things before we finish. Um, So 
we will see that there exist representations. So we'll define what these things are. Of different dimensions. So that sort of means in this context, in the way we've been setting it up, it means not just four by four. Not only four by four. And the reason um, that that's important to understand is that it's important to understand because um, different types of fields transform in different re representations. Make sure you bring the screen. So for example, the fields associated to the quarks and leptons of the standard model transform in what's called the um, spinner representation or the Dirac representation. The Higgs field um, transforms in the scalar representation. The uh, gauge fields, which correspond to photons and W and Z bosons and gluons, transform in the vector, what's called the vector representation. And these representations have different uh, dimensions and properties, okay? So it's important that uh, you, that we are able to understand the notion of representation of um, algebras and in particular of the Lorentz group and its algebra. Okay, I'm gonna stop there for today. And we'll come to that topic. Uh, we'll start entering that topic tomorrow. Any, are there any questions? Um, Professor, I had, a, I had a question uh, about, about Lorentz transformations. Like, why do we assume that they have to be linear in the coordinates? Why do we assume that? Um, Uh, because it will be very difficult to make sense of any notion of relativity if you had non-linearities in coordinate transformation. I mean, if you make, if you make, if you, if you did some some non-linear transformation, the the results you would get would be somehow difficult to understand physically. So it just turns out that the linear transformation is correct. And you know, Einstein was right. It's, you know, it's correct based on observations, not uh, not because it's a hypothesis. No, I... the, hypothesis, the hypothesis turns out to be correct just based on observations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a good question. But... Um, so I have a question. I've set all of these exercises in the uh, notes, which, which, I which I haven't made available to you yet, but I will. Um, uh, if I send these to you, say, uh, today, would you be, because we, all, we, all, we want to, um, we want you to write the solutions and then we want to, uh, me and Ida, the tutor for the course, will, um, I should stop recording. So I can, um, have a look at your solutions 
and we'll hold some sessions to go through them and so on. Uh, would it be unreasonable to ask you to have the ones which are asked for so far to be done by Monday? Or by, sorry, by, yeah, by Monday. Does that seem okay? Gustavo says okay. Oh, there's a, more stuff in the chat here which I haven't seen. Uh -huh. 